Good morning, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the northeast corner of a uh, soon to be sunny South Africa. You find yourselves in the Kruger National Park on a very live dawn safari. The dawn, as you can see, has just broken. I am reclining comfortably on this log, uh, waiting for the sun to come up behind me. My name is James Henry. On camera today is Brian. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, James. Yes, Brian is some distance from me, as you can see. And in the final control, we've got Kirsten McLennan-Smith on the vocals and Rebecca playing the keys. On the other vehicle, Brent Leo Smith, who is tracking a male lion to the west of where we sit right now, and he is being filmed by the diminutive Paul Kruger, a.k.a. VM Dorenbrack. OK, I'm now going to remove myself from this log because there are bits of it spiking into the soft parts of my flesh. If you would like to talk to us during the course of this morning, and we encourage you to do so, please, Hashtag Safari Live if you wish to tweet, like some of the Dawn Chorus, which is calling around us right now. Uh, otherwise, you can talk to us on the email, questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, and if you wish, or watching on YouTube, which seems to be the most stable stream at the moment, use the YouTube chat stream. YouTube chat stream. Uh, and that's how you can talk to us. Ask us questions, give us comments, tell us what you think of Africa, and tell us what you want to see this morning. But first of all, just look at the pinkening dawn sky as it comes up. The sun is about to peep up over the horizon, and of course this is not an experience that we get most of the time, largely because we're either asleep or trying to track something. It's just very lovely, so I think we're going to sit here for a little bit longer. And while I talk quietly to you, just listen to the birds. You can probably hear a few of the doves, the sparrows, there's a woodpecker, there's a crested barbet going. All in the background, the crested Franklin's going. <laughs> sparrows, the bird you can hear going choop, 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 choop. They're often the first birds to call. And what I can tell you is that there is a drag mark next to where I'm sitting, which I didn't notice when I got out of the car, made by a hyena dragging some form of hapless prey, possibly back to the den. So I think what we're going to do is follow that for the next little while, simply because we don't know where the den is at the moment. I did check for it on foot yesterday, but didn't manage to find the hyena den. Isn't that just stunning? We'll just wait for the sun to peep up over the horizon. I say, for those of you who are new to this game, you're on a live safari, and that means, you know, anything can happen. We don't, well, we try and plan. We have a vague plan we go out in the morning, but of course, this being the African bush felt, you just never can tell what is going to happen. And so, let's see. Uh, my plan was to go to the south of the reserve this morning and see if we couldn't maybe find some evidence of Karula and her cubs but now that I've found these hyena drag marks, I think we're probably going to have a look and see if we can't find that. But I cannot bring myself, I'm afraid, to start the engine before that sun has popped up over the horizon. It's too beautiful for words. Here it comes. Here it comes. building dove chorus seems to be building as the light builds as that golden horizon's turned. Well, it's now turning gold. It was, of course, very pink. It's going orange, and now it's going gold. And shortly, a little molten light will emerge from between those two trees. gentle wind blowing. It was a very hot night last night. 
unusual because we're supposed to be, of course, going into the autumn. Come on, son. Is it coming, Brian? I think so. Brian, on Twitter, you say this is one of the best morning views ever. I have to agree with you. Um, we stop in this particular area quite often, simply because you do get this incredible view out to the east. Come on, son. We'll hand you over to Brent Leo Smith as soon as the molten orb of the sun breaks the horizon. Here it comes. He almost expects it to explode up. It isn't up behind the clouds yet, is it, Brian? No. No. You can hear a bit of a breeze. There was apparently some kind of rain warning for today. Uh, of course, the old adage goes, red in the morning, shepherd's warning. Uh, I don't know about there going to be any rain. It is a, a sort of warmish 75 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment, which I think is around 21 degrees Celsius. So it's certainly not cold by any stretch of the imagination. The sun is taking slightly longer than I thought it was going to. Oh, here, it here, it here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. There it is, everyone. Hooray. Good morning, Mr. Sun. All right, on that note, let us hand you over to Brent Leo Smith, who is frantically tracking some lions, and we'll get onto the tracks of these hyenas. Good morning and welcome to this spectacular sunrise safari. I do apologize if my head is hanging over the door, but I am in search of some of Africa's big cats. So we had male lion tracks earlier. Unfortunately, they went all the way south out of our traverse area. But my friend from the west told me the Nkumas crossed somewhere here last night. I'm just trying to find the tracks. There have been a lot of elephants around, so it is making the tracking slightly more challenging. But welcome on the back, and let's see if we can track some cats together. And I nearly forgot to mention, we have the multi-talented cameraman, VM, uh, who's assisting me in my tracking and spotting and general all-round vehicle stuff. And a morale booster, that is correct. VM is definitely a morale booster. So they were on the Sibambili cut line last night, which is just up ahead. So fingers crossed they didn't just do a, a little sneak through Juma and pop into uh, the northern sectors of Buffalo's Hook. I can see. Here we go. How then, Kuma ladies' tracks? Heading due east at the moment. So hopefully. See, they ignored the no entry sign. Bad ladies. So we're going to just have to do the same. Yes. So the one unfortunate thing about whenever we do find lion or leopard tracks in this area, it is a very small little corner, a top little sliver of Juma. And they have been known to sometimes just sneak across to our northern neighbor. But there has been quite a lot of pandemonium in between the Salati males and the Birmingham males. So maybe they've decided to stay slightly further to the west, keep their nose out of that fight. Guys, I had a track here. They might have snuck down one of the game pass there. We've still got one of the ladies here. There we go. She's 
turning, and that is definitely not a lion. That is a very cute, fluffy baby waterbuck. Now, where's your mum? Now, it is not uncommon for adults to leave these guys by themselves, but normally they're lying down in a bit of a thicket. Now, is this the result of lion pandemonium overnight? That waterbuck have been split and chased about. I'm searching for an adult. I haven't seen one yet. But that little baby does look quite relaxed. Cheryl and Lucy are hoping for wild dogs this morning. Cheryl and Lucy, I hope for wild dogs every morning, every evening, middle of the day, middle of the night. They are by far my most favorite of creatures. Now, looking at this behavior, it is quite jumpy. So it could possibly be the result of the lions chasing things around Sydney's waterhole last night uh, and splitting up the different individuals. are out nice and early this morning so what we're hoping if they have snuck across our northern boundary here is that they've gone and looped back somewhere further down which is what they do they do do that quite often this section to the north now seems to be uh, taken over by the Talamati pride having quite a few elephants through here as well which always makes the tracking slightly more difficult Good, good news. No tracks heading due north just yet. Maybe they did a, a sneaky puff at a manoeuvre. You've got them heading east. That's very good news. Now they just must continue east and maybe cut south. So we're going to keep with them. As I said, the Ellies have come through here quite a bit during the night. Let's just go stay with us for a little bit longer. We're going to try to see if we can see anything in that open area towards Sydney's waterhole. Anything going that side, Vim? Okay. Let's just go up ahead and have a quick look. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back and have a check. Let's just quickly peruse the large open plain that is next to. Apologize for the little bit of jumpy signal we experienced there, but we are live in the African bush. So all that can be seen is that lone. There's a lion stalking the waterbuck. There's a lion stalking that baby waterbuck by the looks of things. I can't see it's a bit far. There we go. I think James Richard was requesting a lion hunt on this exact place. So James, this is for you. No, I can't really see. That lion's dipped into that little, little hollow. And as I said, that baby waterbuck being by itself and wandering around is almost certainly from the lion activity in this area last night. Now, Vim, and that brief view we had of that lion, did it look like a male to you? Yes, it, did. it did look like a male to me as well. Yes, 
So guys, this is really exciting. I know this could be quite difficult. If you are a little bit squeamish, especially when it comes to babies, you might want to take a little break from the drive. And I think there's a very strong chance of success. Uh, a single baby water buck alone. Oh, you can just see that line moving. Like a young male. Looks like a young male. I wonder which male lion this could be. So I'm just getting my camera settings correct. Baby water buck. That was not a good decision. Now, that water buck might look for safety in the water. Uh, when there are adults and being chased by predators, they often do do that. Monkeys have spotted the lion. Look, there it goes. Maybe that baby's gonna get away. Don't go over the damn wall. No, come back. We're not gonna be able to see what goes on. No! Oh, we can just sit and listen now. But... What's going on? There's one place we might get a view, and I do apologize, we're gonna have to go to not the prettiest area, but um, around the gate, um, we might be able to see down the boundary towards the Manuleti. He's going crazy. Um, it could be one of the Birmingham's, they do. Um, some of them don't have the biggest mage, but from this, uh, it's very, very difficult uh, for us to. Uh, hopefully, we might get another chance at a visual. Oh, he's back. And good for you, little waterbuck. You escaped, so that looks a bit bigger than he did when he was stalking. It does look like possibly one of the Birmingham boys to me. I guess what? Cat streak's on. The cat streak's back on. Well done, Birmingham. Well, but just a day's break, so. Off we go to try and set another record. Oh, look at that beautiful morning light on that big male lion who got outsmarted by a baby water buck. Now, in certain cases, I've actually seen babies that have been disturbed during the night, whatnot, walk up to an animal like a lion thinking it could be a little bit of safety. Unfortunately, it looks like he's heading back towards us. You can hear the monkey's alarm calling. So they are what first notified that little baby that there was a predator in its midst. There he pops out now. Now, he could be tracking the Inkahuma pride. Oh, have a little drink. Yeah, the monkeys. Lion! 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 
Diane! Diane! Hopefully he does keep walking towards us. Now, the reason he could be tracking the Inkahumas is he might have smelt a female that smells like she's an estrus. like that. Oh. Something gave him a little fright there. He turned back to have a look. At least we know the outcome of the chase. Now, lions only have about a 12% success rate. So only 1.2 times out of 10 that they chase something, they actually catch it. I thought he had a better, better than average chance with a young waterbuck like that. But he probably needed to catch it before it got right out into the open there. When it was on the edge of the thickets, he had a little bit more cover. I did mention a little bit earlier that James and Richard requested just yesterday for a lion hunt at Sydney's uh, dam, and he just says he can't believe he got his lion hunt wish. Well, there we go. Ask and you shall receive. Not always, of course. I ask for wild dogs every morning, but I don't always receive. And, and oh, VM asked for lions, so he's very happy. So we're just going to go pop ourselves over on the other side where we might get a bit of visual as he walks, hopefully, to the south and towards us. So we've just seen that baby waterbuck all alone out in the wild. And Paul Rizzo is wondering, Then, then probably not, but probably you'll find during the day that that big herd of water back there. I don't know if you can see what we're looking at there, everybody. But just watch carefully and you'll see in the middle a grey shape and on the right-hand side of the thing in the middle, or your left-hand side, his right, you can see him moving there, you can see a little tusk and then a snout. And there is a warthog sitting in a hole on his termite mound thinking that we cannot see him, but we can. Can we not, Brian? We can indeed. We can indeed see the warthog. There he is. And normally, of course, they run away as soon as they know they've been spotted in their burrows. He's obviously just popped out to uh, sniff the morning, go and eat some of this lovely green grass. Hmm. Now, just to keep you updated, let's just watch this warthog for a while. But we have been following the drag mark of those hyenas uh, now for the last, well, what was it, 20 minutes or so while you've been with Brent watching that very exciting lion interaction there with a the hapless waterbuck. Well, not so hapless, got away, didn't it? Anyway, the 
drag mark, we're sitting on Gallagher shortcut here. Uh, we went to the old Gallagher shortcut den. The drag marks didn't go there. They headed off back towards Albury's Road. So we're going to go around the block there and see what's happening on that front. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it looks to me like it could well still be on this property. There we go. <laughs> Realised that we'd been here for too long not to have spotted him. All right. Um, so the line is still with Brent. He's back with the picture. We're going to carry on round, see if we can find the hyena den. Uh, we'll see you just now. Lady Luck is on our side this morning. He seems to be coming the right way. There you go. I'm pretty confident one of the Birminghams now, as we can see him a bit closer, and also just from his behavior, the fact that he is scent marking. It does look like he's tracking the Inkahuma girls by scent. So maybe he'll take the tracking duties off my shoulders today. No, no, you're going the wrong way. Turn around. And he's just giving that good, that quarry bush a good sniff and scent mark. Now, the Birminghams haven't been up here too often in the last couple of months. Now, they've been spending quite a lot of time in the south. And, oh, he's going to roar. little contact rule he did there. Mm -hmm. Oh, the lady's going to respond to him, that's the question. There it is again. as he walks directly towards us. I was hope there we go. I'm hoping he decides to take these contact rules into a full walk shortly. Magnificent beastie. Oh, look at that light coming onto his face. think so. Uh, I don't think when that waterback lay down it knew that the lion was there. Now the Impala have spotted him. So I'm just going to be on the game live channel for a second. Mike, Mike. Mike, he has crossed into Vuitella um, and he is heading straight sort of southwest. So uh, he might cross into the, the western sectors. Oh, wait. Still those low contact calls. I wonder if he's not looking for those male lion tracks we were following. I think he's going to have to call a little bit louder than that to reach those other males. But who knows, maybe the Nkuhuma ladies are close by somewhere. Oh, 
time to take a rest. says, what a beauty. Do I think it could be Blondie? I'm not 100% sure, and maybe one of you guys can tell me which Birmingham boy this is. I'm quite sure it is a Birmingham boy, just from his behavior and his, his size and rough age. So he's probably about five and a half, six years old, coming into his prime, and has massive four paws. different scars and scratches and nicks that they carry. And it is tough at the top as a male lion. Lots of, lots of battles to be fought, not only with interlopers, but with their own members of your coalition. Now remember guys, that clickety click is my camera. So you, we do encourage screenshots and share them everywhere with the hashtag Safari Live. Morning, Goodwill. There's one Wanuna Ngala um, just off Sandy Patch near the junction with Bovoso Kari Cutline at Sydney's. He's probably been moving quite a lot overnight. Okay. Oh, look at that light in his eyes. So his ears are still just rotating around listening. Canada Keith says, what an awesome start to the drive. Well, I couldn't concur more. Now, hopefully it can just become more awesome from here. Swanson's spur file calling. <laughs> Definitely not the most beautiful bird call in the bush. And then you might also be able to hear a very high pitched doo -doo -doo, little blue wax bills. Still got a little bit of filling out to do in the mane, uh, but not all male lions develop that full massive mane. And you do have different coloration. You see, it's starting to get a bit darker. Such an important part of a male lion offers huge protection when they are fighting. He's just moving his head from side to side, listening. hoping to hear either contact calls or alarm calls. And you can see the flies already descending. I 
Looks like he's almost closing his eyes to try and keep the flies. Away? the rest of the bush waking up. Crested Franklins, Cape Turtle Doves. Oh, another little contact roll. Oh, there's a short break. And isn't this absolutely spectacular being able to follow? male line in this absolutely gorgeous morning light. So, the lions have obviously a far more developed sense of scent than we do. JB in Michigan is wondering, can he tell which way to go by scent? Most definitely, if the scent's fresh enough, he'll, he'll definitely be able to tell. I'm just going to zoot on ahead, try and get up ahead of him. Zigzag our way through all these trees that have seen the attentions of the elephants. Oh, he's stopping for another break. Let's try getting this slightly more pleasant spot for us. He's right out in the open. Hey, mister. starting to look for his breakfast. He's listening intently. Well, thanks to Angie in Ohio, who says this is Birmingham boy number four. I got a report from the guys up in the Manuleti that one of those Salati males looked like he took quite a beating from the B-boys. Or the Brummies, as they are known to most of the guides in this part of the world. a scorcher today, I think, with the mercury heading well into the 90s Fahrenheit, 30s Celsius. So there's a strong possibility he's not going to move too much more. I think it's probably already mid-70s in Fahrenheit. And we're not even at 7 a.m. yet. James, quickly. James, James. James, James Henry, do you copy? No, 
It seems like James might be off the vehicle at the moment. Stations of Swanunangala is now lying up just to the west of uh, Sandy Patch Road and just to the south of Buffalsuk Gari cut line. One station here, two making their way. Of course. Oh, there we go. A little contact call again. trees the elephants have pushed over. So Lynn in Michigan is wondering, could this be the lion that I heard roaring on the Juma cam this morning? Uh, it is possible, but there was another male that walked straight across quarantine uh, during the night, so that could have been him as well. Standing by, Mark. Negative. Uh, near Sydney's dam, but now moving southwest uh, towards Virtual Access. He's going into this area where the elephants have pushed over every tree. So we're just going to have to try to stay a little bit wider of him. We'll try to stick with him. Just keeping a, a lookout. I thought maybe he might be on the trail of the Nkumas. Maybe not. He might have decided that they've gone too far and he's going to go look for the rest of his coalition. Mark, go to position. Recommendations take Sandy Patch and uh, come around to Virtual Access. I'm in the middle of the block uh, between Sydney's and Virtual Access, probably 100 meters from Access, uh, where there's a large Scotia just to the south of the road and some mud wallows. He's going to pop up around there. And take Sandy Patch. We're going to do some log hopping. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have to do a bit, a little bit more speed. VM, you ready? There we go. So a big Safari Live welcome to Getherson, who's a brand spanking new viewer and wondering, why does this lion let me drive so close to it? Why does it let me follow it? 
Well, there's a couple of reasons. These lions have grown up with safari vehicles around them, and they do not have an instinctive response to safari vehicles. So if I had to walk up to him, he would probably run away during the day, and at night he would try to eat me. But a car smells like alcohol, smell like petrol and oil. Oh, there he is in the scent mark. And as long as you drive respectfully and you don't cross that personal space boundary with them, they pretty much ignore the vehicles, which enables us to take you on these incredible safaris following some of Africa's most large and wonderful animals. Looks like he's going to pop out almost exactly where Mr. Tingana had that warthog kill a couple of days ago. You okay, Vim? No. Okay. Uh, he's taking us through a bit of a bad spot. We have to do some quick maneuvering so we don't lose him. to get through to the road. Oh, that would have been very close. Spotted by Impala. Oh, sorry, Vim. We need it there. Now listen to this. Listen to all these alarm calls. Now we heard monkeys saying line, line, line earlier. Now we've got a pilot doing the same thing. I think he smelt the remnants of that carcass Tingana was feeding on. This is exactly where he had that water kill. He might roll in the nice rotten smell. spotted an alarm calls like this, so the hunt's sort of over. Now, that was so funny. There was, an there was an impala right around that bush. And as the lion walked around it, he got a bit of fright. Mike coming. Mike, I would come a bit faster. Um, he's now in the block. Uh, heading sort of straight south um, along those mud wallows from that big Scotia. Sheila says, cat a day, today, yes, so far it is. What a fantastic start to the sunrise safari, Sheila.
Mr. I think he might be heading towards where we had the tracks of that other male this morning. Listen to those impalas, they're going bananas. Now, two males have got confused and are actually chasing each other, and that's impala rutting. So when this happens, sometimes they get very silly and might run straight into a lion. They almost seem to forget. Mike, we're now getting close to Triple M. A quick update on Commander Bond. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like the gremlins have invaded him so far this morning, so he has headed back for the tech team to try a few tricks. Uh, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, he'll be back with us shortly. said those impalas were shouting lion, lion, just slightly different to the wildebeest and Billy Connolly. Well, he's crossing out of our traverse area, I'm afraid. So I'm afraid we're going to see his bottom disappear. as Wanunangala has crossed Triple M into Simbambili, just to the west of Wanapan. We're just going to stay here in case he decides to come back. The station's in the west, do you copy? Single Birmingham's just crossed over Triple M, uh, just to the west of One Eye Pan, heading uh, sort of southwest into the block. I'll drop a branch uh, to mark it for you guys. So I was hoping he might loop back, but it doesn't look like it. I'm just gonna drop a branch so the guys from the west know exactly where he crossed so they can follow up. You still see him being no, disappeared. Yeah, that looks like a useful branch. So this is how we mark for other vehicles. So whether it's for tracks or for where a, a sighting is. California wonders, are the cameramen strapped in or they de do, do they have to hold on for dear life? Well, they hold on for dear life, Cheryl. Let's see if we can maybe get one last glimpse as he disappears, but I think he has gone too far. He's heading, oh, is that him there? The male we tracked this morning actually just went straight south down this road. We 
Okay, so unfortunately for us, that's the end of the line. He's crossed to the the western sector. So I'm just going to find a spot to turn around. And we'll go see if we can find any more sign of those Nkuma ladies. Here on the Game Drive channel. Stations I've dropped a complete and branch with that one on a guy like crossed. I'm going to head back to the north, follow up on Gonzo and Gomez. Good luck. Carry on. So we're head straight back into that last area where we were trying to figure out which way the Inkahumas were going. I do have a sneaky suspicion that they crossed into the north into Buffalo's Hook, but that doesn't mean they might loop back round south. Stations that uh, Wanunangala has crossed into Sibambili, just to the west of Wanai Pan. I'm leaving the area, I'm going to follow up on last tracks with Gumas around Sydney is Mati. Bit of deja vu, feels like we were just here. Another question again from Ninja Fuzzy Kid. Fuzzy Kid, you wondering on how long do lions live for? Lionesses in the wild are uh, normally about 14 to 15 years old. Uh, males 12 to 13, uh, even probably 12 is a very old male lion. So there's a lot more competition uh, amongst the males and the females in terms of for territories and home ranges. In captivity, they can live over 20 years, but in the wild where it's a bit, t bit more tough and lots of competition, uh, but you're looking at about 15 years for females and about 12 years for males. That's just a little bit of a bad signal area there. So it looks like we threw it. So as I was saying, sort of male lines, oh, go squirrel. Doom. At least it wasn't a suicidal squirrel like last night. We literally decided to do that almost under our tires. But uh, lion coalitions generally only have about four, four years at the top. Uh, there's a very important reason for this. It's to ensure that they don't mate with their, their own daughters. So it's a sort of a thing, but occasionally, oh my lord. Occasionally they, they will happen, but lions are able to inbreed for a, quite a few generations before any negative impact on their genetic line. There's a track of a lioness going at quite some speed here. So the Nkumas could still be around. Is it, am I too close for him? Yep. Yeah, so it's a running track, or jogging, probably better described than running. There it is. 
and you can see how the edges aren't very defined on how it's actually hit the ground with a bit of pace. So it looks like the same size as a male lion, but that's because it's a female and she's run through that soft sand. So the incumbents could very close eye on what's going here so i apologize if i'm not looking at you i'm my head is constantly down Out of the slightly shaky signal area and we'll keep moving out of this area so we're just checking above and beyond where we saw those last tracks heading to the south just to make sure they haven't split up or looped back or got hyena tracks but i'm not in search of hyenas just yet head to the ground looking for tracks to answer a question from Natasha in Ontario. Natasha would like to know how high can a lion jump and do male lions jump higher than females? Oh, I've seen a female probably jump two meters in the air or so uh, but I definitely would say females can jump higher than males just purely because they're lighter. A male lion is so heavy it's quite difficult for them to jump too high but they can jump and females probably a little bit better than the males. Lots of ellies around here, which is making life a little difficult in terms of tracking there. A big herd of elephants can quite easily obliter obliterate the tracks of a pride of lions. Mark, uh, I've only got a single track of a lioness coming back onto Vuyas. Uh, check, I'd check around. Uh, Harlequin access uh, that area for incomers. Copy that. So that single track of a lioness and definitely running going this way, but the majority of the tracks have crossed into Buffalo's Hook. So I'm just have a quick squiz here. But I'm pretty sure if she if they didn't actually make that kill, they would have turned around and gone and joined the rest of them. Move on. So 
Siberia is wondering how much home range or territory can a male coalition claim? Uh, it all depends on the coalition and uh, how many individuals, how many prides of females are available. Uh, the Birmingham's are currently probably sitting around 15, maybe a bit more than that, maybe closer to 20,000 hectares, which is quite big. But, for example, the Mapoho Coalition at one stage were controlling around 45,000 hectares. And there's a little diker sleeping here. They might run. Hello, little boy. So quite often they disappear. This one is pretending we haven't seen it yet. Hello, little diker. Oh, uh, shame. I can just see him leave, moving his legs like he's about to run, so we don't want to disturb him just yet. Just leave him be. A little Grimm's bush diker. So what we will do is we're going to check further down to the to the east. Maybe those lines have come back. They quite often do that, go for a loop. They don't seem to go too far north at the moment because of the, the Salati males and the Talamati females. But with the Birmingham's being up in that area and causing some havoc there, maybe they're feeling safe to f move further north again. It's already really bright. It's going to be a, a, quite a warm day. And that exquisite morning light is sort of fading into that sort of bright African sunshine at the moment. So it seems like the tech geniuses have beaten down the gremlins and uh, James and Brian are back out on the road. So let's go see what they've been up to. Well, what we've been up to, everybody, is uh, basically sitting about the place waiting for Eugene and Connor, uh, Connor, of course, bleary-eyed and still in his pyjamas, to uh, put the uh, new aerial cable on Rusty. So that's why we lost you, I'm afraid. Uh, the aerial cable just through wear and tear, I'm afraid, snapped. So that has now been fixed. And we are on the trail of the hyenas. Those, of course, are not hyenas at all. They are impala. And there's a huge herd of them here frolicking about in the morning light in this grassland that is the quarantine clearings. Now, just a really lovely picture there of them enjoying the safety of the clearing because they can see what might want to come and eat them. And also, of course, they're enjoying their breakfast of fresh green sprouts of delicious grass. The only other thing I would like to show you here, uh, Brian, in this tree is a little black bird. You see in the apple leaf, the leaning over tree over there. That's the one, I can't, that's the one. If you just zoom straight in there, you'll get him. No, I can't see it. You just keep going. That horizontal branch to the left, halfway up the trunk, that's him. He's in there. That's it, you got it. There's just a forktail drongo, and he too is enjoying the morning light, and just nipping around, gleaming insects, hawking a few of them. And all is a piece of marvelousness out here in the wild. Now, the update on the hyenas, excuse the light is bright in my eyes, uh, is that the drag mark went straight across this road, then it crossed over the um, Gallego oh, yeah. shortcut. And we went, did check Aubrey's Road, which is the next road along, didn't find it crossing there. We did find where some elephants had been, so the elephants could have kind of gone yeah, over the tracks. Okay. We're not sure, though. Let me turn Leo Smith off. Um, and so I think it's probably worth us spending a little bit more time trying to find those, and let's see what happens. Now, maybe we'll find the den. That block is not particularly big, so we're just going to drive up there and have a little look and see. Because, of course, to be without the hyena den is deeply distressing for me and many of you as well.
Hello, Dave in New Jersey. Um, you're still waiting to see a snake. Well, Dave, you're in a minority because most people, of course, are terrified out of their wits by snakes. And you say, is it a possibility? Yes, it most certainly is a possibility. Um, <clears throat> bush is quite thick, but there are lots of snakes around. I saw one on my way in here the other day, a Mozambican spitting cobra. They're quite common, uh, not unusual for us to find them around camp. Black mamba is pretty common. A puff adder should be quite common. I haven't seen one here, although one or two people have. I haven't seen one. Brown house snakes, worm sun tree snakes, uh, vine snakes, spotted bush snakes. So there are a lot around the place, and hopefully we'll see some for you. Dave. Most common snake, I don't know what it would be here actually, it would probably be something like a, one of the sort of shovel-nosed burrowing snakes or something like that. You know, little ones we don't often see. Now I will show you where the drag mark that these hyenas walked across. Now for those of you who don't know what that means, a drag mark is basically if you were to take a pillow or a sack and drag it along the ground, you would leave a mark. Now the same goes for a hyena that is dragging some piece of uh, impala or perhaps a kudu or maybe something even larger along the ground, it leaves a mark. You know it's a hyena that's left it, of course, because there are hyena tracks next to the mark. Now, just over here, up ahead, you will be able to see what I mean. They pop out just over here. They go up through there. That's right. They've gone up through there. You can see a game path there. I don't know, actually, if you'll be able to see any drag mark on it. But that's where they've gone. It has gone. And I'll, let me just get, pop out the car quickly and let's see if we can find some sign. Um, yeah. So they came along here. Having come, you can see the path just down sort of into the sun. And they came along here dragging whatever it was. And then they came out onto the road. And we've driven up and down here, of course, a few times, so you can't see it anymore. But they dragged whatever it was onto the road here and then pulled it across into here. And you can just see very light scrapes. I don't think you'll be able to see them, but light scrapes through here. So I suspect that they've gone along this game path here. Now, the other thing we did was we heard that call that they often make at the den, that call that goes, ooh, ooh. You know when the mothers are trying to bring their youngsters out of the burrow, out of the dens? So they could be around here. Anyway, I think we'll keep having a look. Of course, if we want to use sound to find them, this is not going to be a particularly good time of the day. It's starting to get hot already, and so things are going to quieten down, and I think you'll find that the den will go to sleep. Anyway, I'm hopeful that they're still on the reserve and that they haven't gone north into Biffleshook. That was Brent's fear, and I think it's quite a good one because there were lots of tracks going to and from, but of course that's because Sydney's dam is nearby and there's always lots of activity there. Anyway, that's the story with the hyenas at the moment. What's that? Spiderweb. Ah, spiderweb. Oh, that's very kind of Brent Leo Smith. He says he's giving me two days to find the hyenas before he finds them. Um, that sounds A, like fighting talk, and B, like a whole lot of nonsense, because of course he's hedging his bets. If I do find it, then he's lost nothing. If he then finds it, well, then he gains everything, of course. Now, now I'm pretty sure that they're still around here. There are hyena tracks on the road, but I mean, you're gonna find hyena tracks all over the place after a night anyway. So, that's the story with the hyenas. I do need to go on there and foot if I'm gonna find them. So I think what we'll do is leave them for now, because we're not gonna hear much noise from them. And let's go on and just check the southern boundary, and see what's happening over there. It's just so lovely to see all of this grass and all of the flowers that the, um, I mean the grass flowers that the rain has brought. But the one thing about that, of course, is that it brings tremendous amounts of pollen. And pollen, for 
some of us is uh, something of an irritation in the nasal passages. So I have found that my, my nose is streaming somewhat. Uh, Brian also suffers from the odd allergy. Not so, Brian. Yep. yep. Poor old Brian. Thanks. It's OK. We'll get over it. No, we'll survive. We'll survive. We'll push on. We'll push on. Forge ahead. What I'd like to show you is just the great swathe of them. Lots of different species of grass, and I think that grass in a garden is a brilliant idea, simply because it does produce the most beautiful flowers. I mean, look at this one sitting in the light here. Chloris Roxburgiana. Apart from its name, look at it shining there in the dawn light. Stunning. Just, just below that, a white flower, which I think is a trachyandra of some sort. I'm not really sure. Oh, a brilliant viewer, and I forget exactly who it was, yesterday pointed out that the tiny white flower that I found, that's the trachyandra, I think, the tiny white flower that I found yesterday was, in fact, Oldenlandia. Now, most of you will have forgotten that because it wasn't particularly distinctive, but I'll try and find another one. Oldenlandia. And then one more grass plant, just a little bit forward. There, this one here, with the fingers, unsurprisingly called Digitaria, which means basically fingers. Digitaria eriantha. And you can see there, if you look carefully, the little black bits on the end of those little flowers, each of those little pieces on those digitate stalks is a flower each of them produces a little stamen which is filled with pollen. And there's even a little spider's web there. Isn't that beautiful? So that's Digitaria eriantha. Very good grazing grass. Indicates that the rangeland here is healthy and supporting or could support many animals. And indeed it does. If we drive around quarantine clearings, lots and lots of different animals there. So we're going to go down to the south, see if we can't pick up some tracks of the infamous Miss Karula. Of course, it is now the 2nd of April, so if we find those cubs, there's no reason for us not to be viewing them at this stage. They're now two months old. Well, one day or two months old. But I think they are probably still uh, to the south of the boundary. I'm going to answer from Charlotte and Port Elizabeth shortly, but just watch what's going on here. With this. Now, what you have here is a ram impala who has not learned that this is the wrong time to be setting up his territory. So you can see him there going, oh, oh, oh. there's a male running off in the background, and these females are now being herded by him. You can see they were standing looking a little bit alarmed on top of the termite mound. And what he's doing is trying to herd them. Now, they will all come into Estrus, of course, in the middle of May, but there's no ways he will be able to maintain a territory until then because he's not even eating now. All he's thinking about is fighting off rivals and keeping them within a territory, which means that he's going to start losing condition. And when he does that, he becomes weaker and eventually he's going to be replaced by a stronger male. So if you want a mate, as I've said, and I will say this over the next little while, if you're an impala and you want a mate, you have got to time it exactly so that when you are, you know, when the females are receptive, which is a very short period in the middle of May, you have your territory set up exactly at that time. So this male impala is wasting his time at the moment. Enjoying the fresh grasses. And 
and Charlotte. Sorry, I forgot about your question there. Uh, the geckos, you say, do we get geckos here? We do, and you want to know what their habitat is. Uh, their habitat is basically on my wall in my room, and Brian's wall as well, I'm sure. Um, but they also occur in similar kind of structures around here. So by similar kinds of structures, I mean on trees. We sometimes find them on trees. Um, well, largely on trees, I guess. Very seldom on the ground. I've seen a few of them on termite mounds, but that's where you'd find a gecko. Now, you also want to know why it is that their dung, uh, or defecant, is white. Why is it white in color? You'll notice, Charlotte, that it's actually very similar to that of birds. That's, of course, because they are quite closely related. And it's white because, I actually don't know exactly why it's white, but it's liquid and the same color as birds because it comes out of the same opening. There's only one opening in a reptile and a bird, and that's called the cloaca. And urine and feces comes out of the same hole and in the same motion. So it's all kind of mixed together. Uh, why it's white, I actually don't know. I can only think that it comes perhaps from the keratin, except keratin isn't really white, but maybe it's from the keratin of the insects that they eat. They, of course, will, are predators and they will hunt things like flies, thankfully. Not enough of them, in my opinion. But they eat that sort of thing, and maybe it's the keratin, which is indigestible, that eventually turns white in the feces and the urine. But I'm actually not sure why it's white. But it is the same, feces and urine come out the same opening in the same kind of action, same motion as, uh, as, it, as it does with birds. Reptiles and birds, of course, well, while not closely related, are slightly more closely related than we are, for example, to birds or to reptiles. Lots and lots of elephant tracks around, and of course they will obscure any other tracks. Now, this hyena, if you look down the road here, everybody, you will see a lot of tire tracks, but you will also see there, just over the top of my finger, a line. And on the line, you can see some tracks of hyenas there. There's one, there's another one. That is the drag mark. Now, we're a long way from where we originally started following it. We're also a long way from where we originally left it, going across the Gallego shortcut. So whatever this was has been dragged a very long way, and it's been crossed over by elephants a few times. Not so much here, but certainly further up where we were trying to actually follow it. So that's quite interesting. I mean, this indicates that it's the dominant female, or certainly one of the dominant females, that's dragging something back to the den. We know, of course, that subdominant females will not usually drag these things back towards a den site, simply because they'll have it stolen by more dominant members. But it will be interesting to know what's at the end of this. And perhaps she stole it from a leopard. I think that's quite likely, actually, unless it was the piece of something or the lion killed. Let's follow it down. We're still on the back end of this drag mark now. I must say, it seemed to get uh, less and less distinct the closer towards the north we went. And maybe whoever this hyena was was snacking on bits and pieces of it as she went. There, it comes out of there. See that, Brian? Yeah. Come straight out of there. Thank you, Carol. It's very kind of you. You say that I'm the master of finding dens. I think I've actually only ever found one, to be honest. Uh, but I've found a couple of previously active ones active again. I think it's just a process of elimination. But thank you, Carol. We're definitely going to try and find this one if it isn't on Google's hook. So let's head off down here. I don't think, yeah, this drag mark seemed to come out of the block here. Maybe there's a male leopard there looking a bit angry because he's had his meal stolen from him. This is a track called Ingo Alley, which means Leopard Alley. I've actually seen a few leopards on this road. 
and into Ghana in the throes of passion. It's also interesting how the hyenas will take what they steal straight out onto the first road that they can, simply because it's easier for them to drag them along the road. There we go. Yep. She's, she's come along this road here. It has been obscured slightly by buffalo going up and down. We're just going to gently kind of follow this, this thing backwards, see if we can't find what it originally was, but we'll stop at whatever else we see on the way as well. Lots of elephant tracks around, and why we haven't seen any of them today, I don't really know. And I'd be loved, fascinated to know, I haven't obviously been speaking to Brent because we have been down. I'd love to know from you which lion you think that was. I think that's quite interesting. Was it perhaps a male of the Shemungwe pride? Any ideas as to which male lion that was that you saw this morning? Ah, it was a Birmingham, apparently. Birmingham 4 or Blondie? Poor old Blondie. You don't want to be known as Blondie if you're a male lion. the black of the mane, normally the more dominant they are. Poor old Birmingham 4, aka Blondie, going to live a life of subjugation. I also just love these pans. When we get a little bit of rain, you see warthogs and buffalo and elephants really enjoy them too. You get, you get the terrapins and the insects and the birds, especially in the summer months before some of the birds have started to migrate, which of course most have at this stage. You know, they'll come down and drink here. Swallows will fetch mud. Oh, and I don't know if this is too far away from you. At least too close to the car. Can you see the butterfly? Oh, yes, sir. There's a monarch butterfly, everybody. feeding on the nectar in that flower. A flower whose name I have learned 576 times and failed to remember. So anybody who can help me with that, that would be great. It's such a common flower. Anyway, while I'm trying to remember that, let's head across to Brent, get an update from him. I'll continue to see if I can find the end of this hyena drag mark. So Vim and I have just spotted an absolutely fascinating track. We, we can't show it to you yet. It's very obscure and it's been driven over a bit. But it is a track I have not seen in many months. And it looks to be the track of the female cheetah. So we're just having a quick look uh, around this area, hopefully. Uh, it might have popped through. There was one seen in Buffalo's Hook last night, but apparently she very skittish individual. Tracks have been driven over, which does make it a little, uh, very difficult for us to have an exact location on them. They did seem to come off our northern boundary towards the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. And uh, just looking at the tracks, I'm not convinced that they're from yesterday or from last night. I think they could be from earlier. So we will just double check. It is on a very busy thoroughfare. So I just want to make 100% sure that there's not a cheater on property and we don't even know about it. Oh, but we do have a very big herd of elephants. And there is a very big problem for, for cheetah tracking because that's I was hoping the cheetah tracks were going to come out. They look a little bit upset, not necessarily at us. But they are corralling, which they do do sometimes when they smell or, or see a predator. Or there could be a must bull that's harassing them. Hello, Willie Finks. Lovely big group. Could it be a bull? I think it could 
be a bull that's causing this behavior. So quite a bit, little ease in between. Their body language towards us is not showing any sign of aggression. There are a few young bulls who might be a bit uppity, but it looks like they're actually going to engulf us. Hello, mister. So, I mean, his trunk is probably three feet from us as he's eating grass there. Young bull. Really, really awesome. I love spending time with Ellie's like this. And when we get these herds that are so relaxed, we are like them spraying, spraying dust. just got <laughs> the wind blow dust all over us. Oh, there we have there. Got another little one coming right up to us. Oh, you can barely see there's so much dust. Hey, little guys. You can hear that the guy kicking up the dust. Oh, itchy ear. Yeah. Oh, look at this. I'm just making sure. I'm just watching that it's going for the grass and not actually having a sniff and touching the vehicle. So at this young age, you still want to make sure that they don't do that. So especially this guy's a young bull. So he's small now, but he might get to 6,000 kilograms. Uh-uh. Good boy. You just eat your grass. Scratch your ear. So here we've got a bull in his 20s. And you can see he's quite significantly taller than the others and he's probably the one that caused that little there we go there we go he's going to harass a big female there that is a massive female wow that is an incredibly large female elephant and he's harassing her now you can see he's higher in the shoulder already but she is in, an incredibly big female and that little bit of trumpeting and the reason they were all corralled together when we arrived is more than likely because of this young bull. Wow, she's big. Sorry, I know I keep saying that, but that is a massive cow. She is a massive female. And most females probably weigh about just under 3,000 kilograms. Three ton, I'd say she's probably close, close on 4,000. So very big female. Lover in Tucson is wondering, have you ever heard an elephant sneeze? I have, it is quite amusing. It doesn't happen too often. Here comes this young bull who I think is the reason for the slight distress when we arrived. So he 
there's a lot of very big bulls in must at the moment. So it's unlikely he'll be in must, but uh, he still can be quite annoying to the breeding herds. You know, it looks like he's going to go harass that same female again. And you can see the size difference there, and he's a young bull. He's still got quite a bit of growing to do, and he's already taller than that extremely large female. into some quite thick areas and we're not gonna off-road uh, with them there's no need we had such a splendid sighting of them and especially with that young male around causing a little bit of angst is probably the correct word so Cheryl is wondering is asking for a bit of clarification on male and female head shapes. So the females have more angular. When the males are young, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult. But there we go. So that is a female. You see a slightly more angular head shape and a male slightly more rounded. And there we go. So we're going to leave this big breeding herd. I'm still really hoping I can find some of these cheetah tracks, but we'll see what happens. So while we check very carefully around here, let's hope that James has got something fascinating to show you. So as you've seen there with those elephants, they move around the place and you can imagine now Brent's going to try and follow a cheetah track that is around where those elephants have been and that's going to prove very difficult simply because they're, you know, they're moving all over the place so it's very difficult to try and follow the tracks. I haven't found any further sign of the hyenas or their drag mark. So we're on the southern boundary now and just seeing if anything doesn't come across. Maybe, perhaps, Karula. But I haven't heard of any, I'm just listening on the radio now. It's interesting. I'll tell you now. The shadow is on Arethusa. The cubs are fine, but the area is closed off, so we can't go there. Anyway, so we're just going to quietly drive along here and hope the shadow's mother is perhaps closer by. listening to the radio is going fairly uh, vociferously in my ear about not very much. Of course, if you are a, a guide and you're bored and you can't find anything, um, then you talk to your colleagues on the radio rather than to your guests uh, because uh, that just tends to be a bit easier. And unfortunately, that's precisely what's going on in my ear as we speak. I can't see any further tracks of a leopard. So I think what we'll do is head towards Treehouse Dam, see what awaits us there. Perhaps some more elephants. Lots and lots of elephant tracks, and I know that you have seen them, Brent. Beautiful morning, clear blue skies, not a cloud. I don't know where the rain warnings came from. Perhaps Kirsten will let us know if there is indeed likely to be any rain today. But we're now, as I said yesterday, heading towards the sort of dryish season, or the drier part of the season, the end of the rainy season. But maybe because we've had such a dry year, and because weather patterns seem to be so far out at the moment, 
we might have a bit of late season rain. Uh, maybe on Wednesday, so I don't think we're going to have any rain. The temperature is just so lovely this time of year. Nice question. Um, you say you seem it's more obvious that we're seeing young bull elephants rather than young cows. And um, Crystal, it's not so much it's not so much that we're seeing more young bulls. We are seeing some young bulls. There's a group of them, of course, and sometimes they'll stay in an area for a period, and so you'll see them quite often. There is a female leopard track going straight in there. Mm. This is Rula. It's not very fresh. It's also very small. Not small enough to be a cub. Karula's not a large lady. Calls a lady large one's peril, of course, but um, look very fresh to me. But let's go across there. Oh, I've just stalled the vehicle. This is a good time to get hold of Brent Leo Smith. Go ahead, Brent. I'm going to turn him on so you can hear. I'm just a report from the east. Uh, some leopards heading towards this way. Confirm some leopards. Mating, mating leopards. Ah, mating leopards. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Brent. I've got tracks of one female heading north across Gowrie, Main, um, about 200 metres to the east of the junction with Shabam. Okay, Brent. So I'm, I'm not sure if you managed to hear all that. Copy, thanks. Uh, but basically, Brent is not close to this area, but he'll come down here. Let's just drive along the rest of this road. I don't think that they were very fresh, those tracks, and with the mating pair would have been just up ahead here when they went flat. Now, we know that mating leopards don't sleep particularly soundly, uh, and so they may well come across the road. They were left unattended, as Brent said. Let's just see. Maybe we'll get lucky. I suspect quite strongly that will be Tingana and Tandi again. Because there will be a lot of cubs around if they all manage to produce. And uh, Tingana will be the proud father of dozens of cubs around here. He has given us spectacular value over the last little while. So there were definitely no little cub tracks there. Anyway, so, sorry, we were just finishing Crystal's question there about elephant cows and elephant calves, uh, bulls and young ones. So, Crystal, the young cows are going to be in the herds, so you won't find them on their own, so they're not as obvious as the young bulls are. And that group of four or five young bulls that have been hanging around quarantine clearings, they are a little bit more playful than the females, absolutely, in the same way that young teenage boys are, well, they're not more playful than the teeth than oh look, sorry Crystal, I'll get back to you. The Gabar Goshawk. I really didn't land you in it there. Sorry about that, Brian. I got a little bit. You got a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Gabar Goshawk, everybody. Small raptor or occipiter, as we call them. Um, and Crystal, the so the young exactly the same as with human beings. Young girls, say 15 to 20 years old, they are very playful, but they're not physically playful, so they don't kind of push each other around. Uh, young 
men, aged 15 to 20, they're also playful, they'll push each other around and there'll be an, an element of dominance hierarchy going on there. And that's exactly the same as with elephants. So the young bulls will be pushing each other around, playing, yes, they're establishing a dominance hierarchy. The young cows, I've no doubt they're chatting to each other uh, in, in the herds, but they're all, don't, not as obviously playful, but they certainly will be playful. Now, of course, at this stage of the game, it's quite easy to confuse the civet track with the baby leopard track. That's definitely a civet that I can see over there. Not clear enough to show you, I'm afraid. Okay. For those of you who don't know, a civet is a sort of, um, well, it's called a viverid, which means it belongs to a family on its own, quite closely related to the k -k 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 cats and to the mongoose but not a mongoose or a cat. And it's a sort of black and white striped animal. The most easy way to describe it to you, of course, is rather to just show you a picture. So we're coming into the area where those leopards were seen mating. So what I'll do is just stop a little bit further ahead. And we'll just listen and see if we can't hear them because leopards are not quiet meters. They make a very loud noise. That is a female leopard track too. It's not a baby. Let's just stop here and listen for a while. Now, Karula, of course, has been up and down all over this road over the last little while. She's been keeping her den to the south and east of where we are now. That's basically in that direction over there, back and to the left. So let's just listen for a little while and I'll show you a picture of a civet. There is a civet. And above it, the genets. Small spotted cat, and the African wild cat. I don't hear any loud growling. So let me, I'm going to continue along the road here and just continue looking for tracks. This looks to me, now you see it's too big to be one of those baby leopards yet, but it doesn't, it looks like a cat. Maybe it's, an, maybe it's a caracal. Anyway, we're going to drive along here, see if we can't hear a sign of those mating letters. While we do that, let's go back across to Brent, get an update from him, and I'll keep you posted. So unfortunately, no more sign of those cheetah tracks. Now, the interesting thing about cheetah compared to the other big cats is they will spend less time walking on the roads. And that's mainly because lion, leopard, and hyena really like walking down roads. So it's to avoid. So they'll often not even use the big elephant paths and they'll go through the blocks. But uh, I, do, I don't feel those tracks are, are fresh. I feel they're possibly two days old, judging from the, uh, how many vehicles have driven over them and the fact that the edges are very, very undefined. Now, there is a, a building site in Buffalzok at the moment, so it could be the tracks are a little bit more fresh than I think, but there's just been so many vehicles there, and then combined with the elephants, it's, it's near impossible, but very exciting. James has got those female leopard tracks, and, I, and I'm pretty, I'm not sure if he gave you the update that there was a possible mating pair of leopard heading towards Juma as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to slowly drop into that area and give James a hand and maybe just go further to the, the south. Well, 
Chris Rag says, with all the Cubs around, maybe Tangana will have a, a break from his mating duties, but it sounds like he's at it again. So I wonder which female it could be. It could be Tandy. Maybe she didn't conceive from the last bout of mating. So very, very interesting. And one must remember that female leopards will move well out of territory to mate. So even if all our females have cubs, it's possible that the others don't, and they'll move into the area to, to look for that, look for Tingana to mate with. So who knows? Possibly, maybe, fingers crossed, we get another female leopard we haven't seen before who's moving into the area to mate with Tingana. It does seem that Juma is a popular honeymoon spot for, for, for mating leopards. Now, the reason for this is, uh, this is a recent, in terms of uh, Tangana's territory, it's quite a recent acquisition, uh, the whole of Juma. So he does spend quite a bit of time scent marking it and, and calling. And the fact that they had this Gajima male and Mvula hanging around, uh, it's, it's possible that he, he's spending a little bit more time in patrolling Juma than he is in other parts of his territory. He's in the north. So while... That. So while the Salites are, are putting in pressure from, from the north there, uh, uh, the Birminghams are actually moving a lot more because there are other male lions down to the south in the Sand River that I think they hear calling. I think those are called the Machapiri males. So that's why they have been spending quite a, a bit of time in the south. But now they're, they're splitting their time because all of a sudden the, uh, the Salites haven't heard them too close for quite a while. So they've started pushing more and more uh, to the sort of southwest. And that's prompted that Birmingham uh, excursion way up to the north. And you'll probably find the reason Tingana is moving so heavily is because of that Gajima male and Mvula and possibly another male from the Manuleti. So there's competition on the territory. So he's, he's going to be moving through it a lot more often, scent marking a lot more often, uh, calling a lot more often. Opportunity on a nice downhill like this. It's always good to, to turn off the vehicle so you can carry on driving and listening. Uh, Safari Dean says he wants to be reincarnated as Tingana with all the ladies that pursue him. going to develop into quite a strong wind during the day and it is even though it's getting hot it's still getting very hot it's a very dry heat and very much heading towards the colder months there's a bit of a nip in the air it was lacking this morning though but it is going to be a very exciting dry season in terms of predator sightings i feel especially with the the add-on of more traverse at Cheetah Plains, uh, giving us access to a whole host of uh, other other leopards, uh, as well as a good chance of seeing cheetah on a more regular basis.
Uh, nothing yet, I'm afraid. Uh, the gremlins, of course, continue to hamper our efforts, uh, but no leopard tracks at this stage. So what we're going to do is go towards Treehouse Dam. Hang on a second. What's going on here? Ah, that's Eugene. Eugene in his vehicle has obviously been to Arethusa. Eugene of... No, it's not Eugene. It looks like Eugene's car. Now Brent is hailing me on the radio. Go ahead. James, where would you want me to check? Brent, anywhere you like at this stage. Um, I'm going to go and check Treehouse Dam. So, we're going to go and check Treehouse Dam. There's a very beautiful yellow flower here that I wanted to show you as well. There. Now, Brent saw some butterflies eating there the other day. And that's called Senna Paticiana. Now, Principal, you're in Mexico, which is a, sounds like a wonderful place to be. And, Principal, you want to know about um, whether or not the animals learn to use the roads. Principal, it's exactly the same as it is with human beings. It's just easier for them to walk along the roads because there's no grass, there are no obstacles. And so if the road is going sort of in the direction that they want to go, then that is what they'll do. They'll use the road or a game path which can lead to water. So that is Senna Paticiana, and I think that's the, probably the flower on which Brent was trying to identify some caterpillars uh, the other day. Is that correct? Yeah. Interestingly, there were some citrus swallowtails around here. Uh, they are beautiful black and yellow butterflies, and I wonder if it's not them that are perhaps laying their eggs on this plant. And it's a very aromatic plant, so it smells, and that probably means that there are toxins in it, and that'll probably transfer the toxins to the caterpillars, which will make them unpalatable for birds. I suspect that's why they would lay their, um, their eggs on that particular plant. There's just so much endless stuff, an intimidating array of things to learn out here. Names of flowers, what eats them, where do all the myriad butterflies and moths lay their eggs, and what do their caterpillars eat, what are the thousands and thousands of species of insects out here eat? Which plants do they pollinate? How do they interact with each other? When, do, how long do they live? All of the same questions that we ask about mammals. So, I mean, if we see a lion, the, often the first thing that people say is, well, what does it eat? Uh, how often does it hunt? Uh, what does it weigh? What is it, where does it live? How long does it live? And all those same sorts of questions, of course, can be asked about um, the insects and the arachnids and the birds and the reptiles and the flowers and the trees. There's just an endless array of things, an intimidating suite of knowledge you have to try and gain while you're out here. And that's why there's never a question, never a stage at which you get to a point that you understand everything. And Teresa in Virginia Beach, you want to see a baboon's tail. Now, for those of you who don't know, a baboon's tail is a plant that looks unsurprisingly like a, eh, Brian? Baboon's tail. Correct, like a baboon's tail. And Teresa, they are all around here, and so I will find one. And in fact, the road that leads down towards Treehouse Dam has absolutely got a lot of baboon's tails on it. Just gonna turn the radio up slightly in my ear. tail, not in this particular area. This lovely tree here is called a brown ivory, which is quite common. And we've seen that quite a lot. It's a very beautiful example. Burkemia discolor, for those of you who like to speak Latin. Do you speak Latin, Brian? Uh, not very often, no. I don't either anymore. You know, I used to. I didn't really. 
that anyone can actually speak that. Anna Marie, you want to know about Anderson, the Anderson male, where has he been hanging out? You say he's sort of starting to give up. There's a blue headed tree agama, Brian. On this tree, I'm just going to go back. I think he's, they will, of course, scuttle around the tree. This is a lizard, everyone. A tree climbing lizard. I just saw it going up the tree, and of course, as soon as we get anywhere near it, we'll just go around the other side. Oh, there it is. It's a female. Can you see it? Mm. At the base, let me reverse back a bit. Okay, at the base of the tree, Brian, right at the base, you'll see on the right-hand side, it'll be almost invisible unless you zoom in on it. Um, keep going up a bit. There. That's it. There, you got it. There we go. That's the female blue-headed tree agama. Isn't that beautiful? Look how magnificently hidden she is. And how her color on her back specifically is exactly the same color as that of the bark of that cambritum tree. The male, of course, who is less important to the survival of youngsters, has got a bright blue head, which means he probably gets eaten a lot more than she does. Isn't she cool? So you can't see the size there, but she's, she's about mm, probably from tail tip to nose tip about a foot long. She's about 30 centimeters or 12 inches. So she's quite big. Very fast, very good climber. And she's leapt into the tree like that to try and hide herself. She would have been on the ground and she would have been eating insects there. Just as Brian zooms out, just appreciate the camouflage, because if we were to walk past this tree now, we'd never see that. Never. That's brilliant. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That's so cool. I particularly love her, her kind of, um, uh, her eye shadow. She's got some kind of sparkly eye shadow. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Um, I think I was answering a question, wasn't I? Uh, mm, 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 mm. No, no, it was just the baboon's tail, which we'd already discussed. I was waffling on about something or other, but I can't remember what it was. Such as the you know, the, the trouble of age creeping up on one. Very big year, this for me, Brian. I'm getting very old this year, you know. Are you? Yes, we're both getting quite old, aren't we? Ah, now, Megan, you want to know a little bit more about the monkeys that are around here. And um, the monkeys around here most obviously demonstrated by that one sitting in the car over there. That is Brent, Brent Leo Smith, of course. Hello, Brent. Hello, Jamesy. Yes. Um, and a little avoidance. I bet you Vim and I are going to find the leopard now. Oh, uh, OK. Of course we are. Well, off you go then. I'm apparently heading towards Zoe's Road, so... Yeah, I think circling this area was probably quite a good idea. OK, we'll check the water. See you shortly. Oh, yes, and you can see Viam's beard. Before you drive off there, um, I've been Ooh. talking about Viam's beard. Splendid. Oh, yeah. um, so if we could just uh, zoom in there, Brian. We've got a wonderful picture there of Viam's beard. Now, um, Paul Kruger, of course, whose name was given to this uh, wilderness area we're in, and not because he was a conservationist so much as because he was a biltong eater, but uh, Paul Kruger, who looked very similar without the moustache. And I'm trying to convince VM to shave off the moustache region so that we can just have a real good look at what Paul Kruger in his younger years looked I'll like. I'll try that. I'm tempted. You're tempted. Yeah, good. Never. <laughs> See you later. Um, 
Right, monkeys, back to the monkeys of the area. Only three species, well, four, four species of primates, Megan, we get out here. One, the human being, of course. Uh, then you get two, uh, five. Two species of um, bush baby or galago, the thick-tailed, which is very unusual here, and the lesser, which is quite common. They look like little lemurs. And then, of course, you get the vervet monkey. It's the only true monkey that we get out here. And then the chakma baboon which is a wonderful, wonderful primate if you spend time with them. As long as they don't get too used to people, they can become a little bit of a menace if they get used to living around the camp. But those are the only two that we get here. Of course, up into the more forested areas of Central Africa, you get many, many different species of primate and different kinds of monkeys. Thank you for that, Megan. Right, we're now... This is the kind of area where you would find a baboon's tail. Slightly open, quite rocky, slightly poorly drained soil. And there will be one, if not on this road, just around the next corner, we will find one. So, Teresa, hold on. We'll drive a little bit faster to try and get there. Ryan, why is it that I've seen 700 baboons in hills today, but I can't find one now? For love nor money. Okay, we will find one, I do promise you. Then, of course, the wild sesame, which is all over the place. Beautiful pink flower, there we go. And I'm sure Brent showed you this. He's obviously very good with his wild flowers and the wild sesame. It's just too lovely and nice. Not to be confused with the wild foxglove, which of course contains all sorts of nasty toxins. What's that orange one in the back? And the orange one at the back there, Brian, thank you for that. That's called dropping your mate in it. Uh, is a lion's eye or a roadside pimpernel, but because it's not open, and I'm not going to open it, I can't tell. So the roadside pimpernel's got a bright yellow center to it, and the lion's eye does not. Both bright orange flowers. Thank you, Brian, for that. You're very welcome, sir. Next sparrow that flies overhead, I'm going to point it out and assist to track it. I'm on the baboon's tail. I think we are very close to the baboon's tail. I don't want to quickly find I just want to quickly find it. So Kirsten, and if you don't mind, give me one second. It's just around here, on a left-hand side. Lots of them. Unless they've all been eaten by something. Oh, come on. laying in amongst them here. Teresa scoured this area. There they are. <laughs> Whoops. There we go. There's a baboon's tail, Teresa. Quickly get out and then I will leave the to Brent. So this is the baboon's tail. Obviously, <clears throat> and it looks like a baboon's tail. It produces very beautiful, very subtle smelling lily-like flowers, and they really do smell delicious. And this blue flower next to it is a comelina. An obvious comelina. Uh, well, it's not obvious comelina, I suppose. It's a comelina africana, which is the most common one that we get here. And that's the blue one, or the wandering Jew. And one last one over here, a fairly ropey example of hibiscus. But this one, of course, Brian, I'm not sure if you'll know, what does this leaf look like? Um, does it look like any plant you've seen before? I can't tell. You can't tell. That's very good, Brian. It looks a little bit like a cannabis leaf. 
which of course is an illegal substance out here, cannabis sativa marijuana. And because of this shape of leaf, this particular hibiscus is called hibiscus cannabinus. Mm. Without further ado, let us go across to Brent Leo Smith and uh, hold him to his assertion that he is going to find the leopard. So, I know James has been showing you a few flowers and I've just spotted one I don't know. Now, that is actually a wonderful thing. So, I'm just going to collect a sample of it to take home and see if we can figure out what it is. Now, I definitely didn't see this particular flower last uh, wet season. Now, what often happens is with a lot of flower species is that some of them will only flower every two or three years. Very interesting, very delicate little flowers. I'm going to pop it on the dash so you can have a closer look. And you can see how delicate those little flowers are. And I did see another flower that we do know. That's always interesting. While we're here. And I'm also using this opportunity. Breaking up. Using this opportunity to listen for possible mating leopards. So you know they make that incredible noise. So always good to stop and listen a little bit. And this is the area where they might cross into Juma. So this little flower I haven't seen before. And definitely didn't see it in Juma last wet season. And I don't actually remember seeing it ever before. I mean, tiny, very delicate, very, very, very specific. So I'm going to have to try to do some research on this little guy. Very, very interesting. Now, the flower we know, and we've seen, but we haven't seen many of them for quite a while. And I looked for one of the seeds, but the seeds weren't there. It's called a large devil thorn. Now, used for quite a lot of different things. Now, if I take a few leaves and I pop them into my hand like that and I add a dash of water and then I mash them together, and you can see it creates a very snotty consistency. So you can actually see that the stickiness. Now, this is an actually a natural soap. Makes a bit more water in it. There you go. You can see. So you can wash your hands with it. Um, it's also used in traditional medicine as a lubricant for ch difficult childbirth. And very interesting plant. Very, very beautiful. And I will try to find you one of the seeds and just keep, finish washing my hands quickly. There we go. And, uh, oh, no, I've lost it. Uh, a very, very interesting little plant. So the, the chemical compound is very similar to the, what they call sap opens that you find in soaps. So very interesting little plant. And I will try to find you one of the seeds. And it's got the name of devil thorn. It's got a very specifically designed seed that's designed to slip in between the angular tubes. Can cause them quite a bit of pain and discomfort, but that's how they disperse their seeds around different areas. Now, now, speaking of ungulates, and one that might possibly uh, move a devil thorn from a place to place, uh, let's go see which ungulate that is with James. I just think this looks like the most wonderful place to be lying at this stage of the day. The heat's starting to build, and it just looks so relaxing and so pleasant in that pool. I'd very much like to be in there. Obviously not with the buffalo, that would result in severe injury probably, a pawpaw-sized hole in the midriff, which is uh, well, difficult to treat. So it would be very exciting to be able to lie in a pool and just enjoy the wandering, the wondrous heat of this autumnal morning. Lovely gentle breeze blowing through. And that is a buffalo, in case some of you are wondering. There are a few of them here, of course. They like to spend the days lying in the water. 
This one, of course, is chewing his cud. And that means that he's basically regurgitating his food back into his mouth, re-chewing it and then swallowing it. After a long night, probably, of grazing. And the buffalo definitely put on quite a lot of condition over the last little while, while Brian and I were away. Brian, if you can just, sorry, if we can whip round to the left, and that one just in front of us there. I don't know if you can see, his hips are not showing at all, and he's looking really well muscled on the hindquarters, and that's completely unlike, he's also now, of course, having a fairly large poo. And um, he's, he looks in really good shape, and the buffalo was starting to look a little bit ropey when, when I left. And when I left here, I drove out and drove back to Johannesburg. I drove through the community lands and the cows out there were looking absolutely dreadful, really looking starved. And I think you'll find um, that they too are starting to look a bit better than this now. Very close relative of the cow is the buffalo, same family. And that means, of course, that while they can't interbreed, 